I haven't been in teaching on Sunday night for seven months. I was having problems with some uh, blood clots on my lungs, but I went on uh, blood thinner, and now they got me off the clots, and I'm back to teaching on Sunday night. I'm going to have to review some things to cause you to remember where we are. We're in the book of Revelation, and it's connected with Daniel and some other books. I'm going to try to explain to you in very detail tonight. You've heard me preach on it, but I want to give you some exact points on why I do not believe in a thousand year rain after this is all over and why I do not believe in a pre-tribulation rapture Now, believe it or not, most of you, if you were in a Baptist church or any kind of Protestant church, this is major doctrine of the Independent Baptists, the Southern Baptist Convention, and uh, many of the Pentecostals. They believe that there'll be a thousand-year reign at the after time is over with. Now, I, always, I never understood how could you have 1,000 years. Is that a period of time? Could you call that time? Could you call a thousand years time? This is an obvious question. <laughs> yeah, you could call it time. Now that's supposed to be, according to these, these dispensationalists, now the majority of America are dispensationalists and I've never heard a Baptist preacher define the word dispensation. Never. Including my father and all of his friends. <coughs> they talk about dispensations like they were periods of time. Here's what they believe. They believe, and you've got many dispensational charts. I've seen them around churches. I've seen preachers preach on them. As a little kid, I'm going... I don't understand that. And as a grown man, I'm saying, I don't understand that. I'm still saying the same thing. They start off, this is the majority of churches in America. They start off and say, Adam lived in innocence. Well, he did until he sinned. That, they say that's a period of time period of time and then they say that after this that uh, men after the flood Noah and his descendants after the flood lived in a period of conscience they were dictated by their conscience well that's not true because revealed God revealed himself to Noah by faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet Noah lived by faith not by conscience God somehow spoke to these people and they believed him so from Adam until Noah was conscious then they say the next period of time is the law among the Jews and then after you come through the law you go to the prophets and they say these are periods of time and people were saved differently. And then they come to what they call what they call the dispensation of grace. Well, I think Noah was saved by grace through faith. 
Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's what the Bible says. And the song says, and he landed high and dry. So you have Noah was saved by grace through faith. And then you have the prophets up to New Testament times. And they call this, this is what these dispensationists call the age of grace. And they say that is the New Testament church and no one else is in the New Testament church. No one else is in this age of grace. The church is just New Testament. New Testament church. Here's what bothers me. The Bible says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself, he died for. The New Testament English says he died for it. The church is not an it. That word it in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, the 25th verse, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for, the word is A-U-T, Ada. That Ada on the end of the word, it's, it's a form of A-U-T-O, which is self. An automobile is self-mobile. And Ate is feminine gender. Always when you have an Ada on the end of a word, it's feminine gender. That's how they could tell whether it was male or female. You could have A-U-T-O-U, and that could either be masculine or feminine, depending on the pronoun it was pointing back to. I've said this a thousand times. When the Bible says, the beast, the beast gave, the, the dragon gave the beast, the dragon, this is in the 13th chapter of Revelation, the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and his authority. That is a bad translation. People say, Jim, you awful smart aleck saying you know more than the translators know. It doesn't take a lot to know more than some of them if you go to the original scripture and see what it says. And his authority, A-U-T-H-O-R-I-T-Y. Dragon is the word dracon. It means to fascinate or make you feel good. It doesn't mean a fire-breathing dragon. It means, it means the same thing in the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians about Satan was transformed into an angel of light. Satan doesn't come dressed like an, an evil-looking thing with horns and a tail. Well, here's the whole point. All two can be masculine or feminine depending on the antecedent. Antecedent is a, is a simple English term. It means the noun or pronoun that is referred back to by a noun or pronoun. Noun or pronoun. Well, when the Bible says the dragon gave him his and his seat and great authority, each time you find him or his, it's this word, A-U-T-O-U. A-U-T-O-U. And Mr. Mounts tells us that it will de what determines whether it's masculine or feminine is the antecedent. So the antecedent of, of him and his is referring back to the beast. Well, the beast can't be a him or his because it's A-U-T-O-U. And the beast is the word totherion. And totherion is neuter gender. And people say, you're awfully smart. I like thinking you can out-translate these, these uh, translators of the King James Bible. I'm sorry, but even in the interlinear Bible, when you read Revelation 13, it says, The beast gave it its power, its seat, its great authority. It's, it's the way it's translated 
in an in an ear Bible. That's because the beast has always been an it. The beast was like a lion, a bear, and a leopard. Over here in over here in Daniel, the seventh chapter, it's a lion, a bear, and a leopard, and it is Babylon, Persia, Greece, and then you have the beast with iron teeth, which was Rome that overthrew these. So it's still the same thing here. This is what's really, I said it this morning, preachers are really confusing America because everybody's looking for something real evil in the way of a dragon, and it's a man. And they made all these movies, The Omen, and, uh, and the Antichrist is born into a family, and, uh, and the only thing he ever acquires in that first movie was he rises to the ambassadorship of an ambassador to England. Well, I'm sorry, the beast has to be bigger than that. He's got to run the world. It's crazy. You'll see movies about the beast being a man. It's not a man. It's a world ruling system. And it's going to be founded on tolerance. Let me just say this. How are you going to have, when the Bible speaks of a one world government, how are you going to get Muslims to agree with uh, Protestants? How are you going to get Muslims to agree with Catholics? You're not. What they're going to do, it looks like what they're going to do <clears throat> is do what they did with the Catholic Church when they allowed all the, <clears throat> the hordes that were rampaging across Europe to come into the Catholic Church and they would accept their fire and tree worship, which was Christmas, and they brought it into the church. That's what it was. That was what it was about. So what they'll do is they'll have to tolerate everything. Now, let me get back to this. <clears throat> I don't believe in a thousand-year reign because they call this New Testament church and they call all these different dispensations as God is saving people differently. He never did save anybody different. It's always by grace through faith. And there's not, dispensation doesn't mean periods of time at all. When he came to Noah, what did Noah do for God to come to him and say, build an ark? What did he do? Huh? But, but what did he do in order for God to tell him to do that? Nothing. What did, what did you do in order for God to come to you and say, you're mine, I'm going to birth you? What did you do? Nothing. Walk down an aisle? No. no. You didn't do nothing. That's called grace. Grace is the word charis. It means unmerited favor. We didn't do anything to merit being sons of God, did we? Nothing. He came to, I don't know if you ever thought about it, Let's get over here in the New Testament. Right after Jesus is, Jesus is born in this thing that they call dispensation of grace, and Paul is struck down on the Damascus Road. And we're just getting right at the beginning of the New Testament church. He's struck down on the Damascus Road. What did he do? Did God say, I would like for you to come and accept me as your Savior? I'm going to have... I'm going to have Peter come over and sing, just as I am. Come on, Paul, won't you accept me? He struck him down and said, why are, you, why are you fighting against me, Paul? He called Paul. He didn't ask him if he'd like to accept anything, did he? He didn't do that to any of the prophets over here in the Old Testament. He didn't say, would you like to accept me, Jeremiah? He said, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew you, Jeremiah, and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. This is not your choice. When he told Matthew, follow me, be in the same way, the narrow way with me. Matthew didn't have any choice. All of God's people didn't have any choice. This is not a choice thing. It's God's choice to pick who he pleases. Now, dispensation is the word O-I-K-O-N-O-M. Oikonomia is the word dispensation. If you say oikonomia real fast, oikonomia, economy, economy. 
It just is our word economy. When you look up the word economy, notice N-O-M-Y. N-O-M-Y comes from nomia. That is the word law. Nomos. Law. That is the word law. And okonomia means the economy of a household. And you have to understand that we are the house of God. So the economy of the household is God's word. It's the nomos. This is not... That word economy is the word dispensation. And what's amazing, I never heard a preacher even look this up. Okonomia is also the word steward. Ship. The steward of a household was the one who ran the household. We're the house of God. Christ is living in us, and we're supposed to be living the, as in the house of God. The Bible says that judgment must come to the house of God. Whose house are we? So we're God's house. He lives in us. Economy has nothing to do with these periods of time. Every one of these people were saved by grace through faith simply because God came to them, convicted their hearts, just like he came to us and convicted our hearts. And then some preacher got us confused by telling us we have to walk down an aisle and accept Christ. Not true. God picks out who he wants to. We were preordained before the foundation of the world to be his. I said this morning we have to learn to behave ourselves and be obedient to the word of God. Not in order to be saved, but because he is saving us we are his chosen, picked out people. And nobody has ever been invited into the kingdom. No one. Invitation is a false doctrine. It causes people to come down the aisle. I used to walk the aisle constantly. My father would preach, and he would preach hell and damnation and, and these scare tactics and and doomsday, and I'd be going, oh, God, I don't know that I'm saved. And he'd say, if you don't know tonight, this may be your last chance. And boys, 11, 12-year-old, I'd be running down the aisle trying to get saved, and I never could figure out how to do it because I couldn't do it. All I had to do was believe. But uh, when I grew up and studied the Bible, I started looking back when I was 6 and 7 and 8. And I used to pray to Jesus at seven and eight years old. Jesus, I want to come be with you one day. That was before my father started preaching. The Lord revealed to me before he started preaching that I was one of his. Didn't take an invitation down an aisle. That is, that's ungodly. Any preachers watching, you're ungodly when you give invitations. He doesn't invite anyone. He commands his people, follow me, and that's an imperative mood. It means to be in the same way with. Akulatheo was the word. I use that a lot. Now, they've come up with the dispensation of grace, and they come up at the end of that with a pre trib rapture. They say there's going to be a seven year tribulation period, seven years, and this will be the end of time. And they come up and say, after this seven years, this at the beginning of the seven years is where the church will be raptured. The word rapture, there's nothing wrong with the word rapture. That's a Latin term. And it means to be taken out to meet the Lord with joy in the sky. What I'm here to tell you is that we're going to be taken out at the end of time And there's going to be seven trumpets sound, seven trumpets at the end of time. Remember, a trumpet is a voice. A trumpet tells you something. When they sounded the trumpet in the military, I went to Texas a when it was when it was compulsory military school. More officers served in World War II out of Texas A&M than any other school in the country, more than West Point, more than, more than Annapolis. And I was going to be an officer in the military, but I didn't go back. I went a year, and, and I didn't have the money to get back in school. Well, when a trumpet sounds, 
Reverently in the morning, you get up and they sound a trumpet. That's reverently. That means it's time to get up and go to breakfast. Fall out. I know what it means. And then they had trumpets sounding for different things. At night, you would hear taps. Or when somebody would get killed, they had what they called silver taps. And you'd march down to the administration building. Nobody would talk. Not a word. That would be one of the Aggies was killed. We'd stand in front of the and the administration building where they'd pay what they call silver taps. Da, 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 da. What I, point I'm getting at is a trumpet is a voice because it's telling the troops, and when you're going to charge, they go, da, 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 and the guy's sounding the trumpet charge. Anytime you see trumpet in the Bible, it means a voice. In fact, the Bible says over there in 1 Corinthians, let me read this. Because when you find trumpets in Revelation, it means the same wherever you find it. Look in 1 Corinthians 14. I brought this out before. 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. And he will say, he's talking about the tongues or the gloss of the foreign languages being spoken over there at Corinth. Corinth was the very center of the world. All the ships came through there, the sailors come in there, the Traveling salespeople came in there and they had dozens of glossa, which is the word foreign language, being spoken there. And Paul said, I don't want anybody coming in here that speaks in a foreign language without your own interpreter and go over to the side and do it by twos and threes. If, the, uh, if there was such a thing as Pentecostal tongues, they're doing it wrong. They're not doing it by twos and threes. They're getting on TV and shandala makandai manda shandai. And that's not even what it's about. Don't have time to go on that. But when you look over here in the 14th chapter, he says, 14th chapter of, uh, I turn to the 15th. I better turn back here to 14. In the 14th chapter, the Bible says in verse 8, If a trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? You have to hear the trumpet call. It's a, it's a call to some kind of battle. In fact, when you look over here at 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, a verse that all these pre-trib rapture people love to go to, and they think this is the secret coming, the fourth chapter. And when you define some words, you find out it's not a secret coming. It's at the very end of time, and I have to say that, in order to teach this. All right. First Thessalonians 4. 4. This is the favorite verse of all the preacher of rapture people. Here in First Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning the believers which are asleep. It don't mean their souls are asleep. Their bodies are asleep over there in the grave or in the tomb that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, those that are dead in Christ, their spirits are with the Lord, and their bodies are in a grave. Don't have time to go into that in detail. Will God bring with him? For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, now, most of the dispensationalists will say, we were it's alive and walking around remaining. It don't mean you're walking around going to your job. That's not the, what the word remain means. The word remain is the word perilipa. P-E-R-I-L-E-I-P-O. P-E-R-I-L-E-I-P-O. The very definition of that word really puts some reality on this. The word means to survive. The church is under attack and people are dying and we which are alive and survive this great slaughter that's going to be going on at the end of time. We which are alive and survive. Oops, I flipped away from my... Got to flip back to it. We which are alive and survive to the coming of the Lord shall not... Prevent. Prevent is a word that means to go before those that are asleep in the grave. 
He says, We which are alive and survive shall not go before those that are dead in Christ unto the coming of the Lord shall not go before those that are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. This will be the last trump. The last one hadn't sounded before this one. We're going to be changed at the last trump. And that word, that word shout, kaluo, K-E-L-L-E-U-O, that means a war cry. Now how in the world can this be the last, how can this be a pre-trib rapture when they say that at the pre-trib rapture we'll be caught up at a silent coming? How in the world can it be silent and how could it apply to this if when the shout is a war cry and Jesus says, charge to the angels. How could that be a silent cry? How could he be saying, charge now everybody come up here for seven silent years? It makes no sense whatsoever and that's what all these dispensationalists say they say the silent coming is right here what's he doing shouting with a war cry and the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and survive unto the coming of the Lord there's going to be an attack against the church that's what we find in the 13th chapter of Revelation and that's what we find over there in the seventh chapter of Daniel. There's going to be a, a war against the true believers at the end. If we're close to the end, it's not going to be fun. Have you noticed that evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse? Every week we got somebody shooting somebody in schools. The guy over there out there is in Las Vegas that killed the 50-something people from the top of a building people are kind of forgetting about him because you got somebody killing somebody nearly every week this is evil men and seducers getting worse and worse and worse i have more to say on that now let's go back over here to revelation the well first of all i got to put a time factor on the rapture Let's put a time factor on it. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. This will, I've never heard anybody even deal with this. 1 Corinthians 15. I want to really spell this out and slow down and go through it real slow. 1 Corinthians 15 chapter. Verses 51, 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We, the church, shall not all sleep. Sleep was a term for dead believers, people who had died in the faith. When Jesus went to raise Lazarus from the dead in John 11, he said to the apostles, Lazarus is asleep. They said if he's asleep, he'll be okay. He turned to him and said, Lazarus is dead. You don't understand. He's dead. His body's in this grave, but his spirit was with God. When you think about, there's a verse that'll show you where the people are over in Matthew, the 22nd chapter. It'll show you where dead people are. Are they dead in a grave? No. Look here what, Matthew, the 22nd chapter, says. Jesus is confronting the Sadducees who say, who don't believe in a resurrection, saying, saying to Jesus, if a man dies and he leaves his wife and his brother marries her, because that was the custom of the Jews, for the surviving brother to take his wife and raise up his firstborn son as in memory of his brother, and that would be considered his brother's son. And he goes through this, and the 
and the um, uh, and Jesus says, "You dare do not knowing the scripture, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor give in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven." And that kind of eliminates fallen angels intermarrying with women because they don't marry nor give in marriage. How people think that God created angels with reproductive organs to intermarry with physical women, I don't know where they come up with that. That's crazy. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken of unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. He is saying Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are living in heaven with him. Their spirits are. Now, let's go back over here to... You've got to tie all these things together. Let's go back over here to, to Revelation, the 10th chapter. Revelation 10. Do not believe in a thousand-year reign. I got so much to say about thousand, I can't even get to all of it. All right. Now, look here in Revelation, the 10th chapter. So we're going to be changed. Well, I didn't read 50. Did I read 1 Corinthians 15? I didn't read that, did I? 15, 51, and 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. I believe the word is a lasso. A-L-A-S. A-L-A-S-O. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Let me go back there before I go over here to... To Revelation, let me slow down. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, the word moment is atomos. A-T-O-M-O-S. A-T-O-M-O-S. We get our word a T O M. Atom. At one time, we believed that the atom was the smallest particle of matter. The atom has got, it's got a, a nucleus with neutrons and protons, and depending on what kind of substance it is, it'll have these orbits that these electrons are circling around the atom. We thought that was the smallest particle of matter. The protons have a positive charge, the electrons have a negative charge, and that's what's holding them together. It's the positive charge of the electrons pressing inward. Who put those charges on the atoms? <laughs> you think God did that? when the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat and all of this sphere we're in, this universe is going to melt, what does God have to do to do that? All he has to do is pull all those charges, those negative charges off the electrons and pull all the positive charges. Do you know that atoms are basically nothing and that's what you're made of, nothing? Because the space between the nucleus of an atom to these orbits of these electrons, one of my chemistry books says it's like having a marble in the middle of a field and traveling a hundred miles out here and nothing but space in between. Most of what we're made of and the, and the electrons are so small they said they don't even deserve an atomic number in my chemistry books. In other words, most of what we're made of is nothing. The inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Uh, that's what we are. We're basically made out of nothing. If we reduce the matter in our bodies, just the matter itself, take all of the, the space of the atoms, we would fit on the head of a pen and with plenty of room to spare. We're really not much of anything. That's what we are. And we think we're important if we can gain position in the world. God says, no, you're not. So, 
Atomas. That is that word. It was the the reason they translated it to atom was because it was the smallest particle of matter. We'll be changed in a moment. Atomas. At the twinkling of an eye. I had forgotten what the twinkling of an eye was. Uh, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, I looked on the internet. The eye twinkles at about one billionth of a second. About a billionth, it's approximately a billionth of a second. That's a, it's the speed that a light goes. Now, light's traveling at 186,000 miles per second. It's the speed that a light goes and hits the retina, or the, the retina is the inner lining of the eye, and goes back out in space. They said that's about one billionth of a second. So that's how quick. Yeah, Jesus is not going to come where we can look up in the east and see his coming. We can't see anything. It'll be so fast. So we'll be changed in a moment in the twinkle of an eye at, I've never even heard a preacher say, at the last trump. That's the time factor. <coughs> so there's got to be some first trumpets, don't there? Has to be. Well, when you go, let me just go ahead and let me go back to Matthew and let's look at the time factor at the end of time. Matthew, 24th chapter. I brought these out, but I want to show you why I don't believe there is a pre-trib rapture or why there is a thousand-year reign. Now look back here at Matthew 24. The apostles are interested. Lord, when are you going to come back? He says, I have to go away. If I go away, I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. And when he comes back, it'll be at the last trump in a moment in the quick of an eye. You can't even blink that fast. The quick, twinkle of an eye is fast you can blink. That's a fraction of a second. But you can't even, you can't even pinpoint twinkle of an eye. At the eschatos, E-S-C-H-A-T-O-S, Eschatos means the last in a series after which no other trumpet will sound. So in this last series, you've got to find some trumpets. Look here in Matthew 24. The apostles asked Jesus, I know I've taught on this before, but I want to emphasize a couple of things about how the end, when it comes, it'll come in the twinkle of an eye. And you can't even, you can't, when he comes in the sky, he's going to come as the lightning shines from the east to the west. It never occurred to anybody, I never heard a preacher say, how does the lightning shine from the east to the west? Well, you got the earth sitting here on an axis. East to west is going to be completely around the world, isn't it? If every eye is going to see him, the light of God will shine completely around the world, and every eye shall see him. How, that, how he can do that, I don't know, but he's going to manage that. Well, the apostles come to Jesus and say, Lord, you said that one stone will not be left upon another. What's going to be the sign of thy coming of the end of the world? And he says, all these signs will happen. He says, many will come, and they'll deceive you. It's going on right now. Deception is here. I said it this morning when I was talking about the preachers can't even recognize the truth. They don't know definition of words. He says, many will deceive, and they'll even say that I am Christ. People misunderstand that. They're not, how could they deceive saying that they were Christ? They're not going to say they're Christ. Jesus said they're going to come saying I am Christ, and they'll deceive many because they won't believe what I've said. And then he says, there'll be wars and rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And they'll deliver you to be afflicted in verse 9, and, and the church will go under attack. I'm not talking about the Baptist church. I'm not talking about the uh, Pentecostal church. I'm talking about the true church, the called out of God. That's to believe the truth will be attacked. And there'll only be a few of us 
they'll be saying to people like me, Mr. Brown, you're really disturbing people running down these other preachers. You've got to stop that. I expect that to happen on our TV programs, saying you can't do this anymore. And they, if they amend the Constitution, say, we've got a new constitutional amendment. You can't offend anybody else. We're going to do like they're already doing in the rest of the world. If you live in the United Kingdom, which is English, then you'd live in England or Ireland or Scotland or any of the places where the Queen rules, Australia, Canada. You can't go on TV in those nations, I believe Bermuda and the Caribbean. <coughs> you can't go in any of those and go on TV and run down any preachers according to their fairness doctrine. That's why we can't get on TV in Canada. We can't get on TV in England. They wouldn't allow me to preach. In fact, in America, they won't let us on direct TV. Dave sent them a copy of one of my messages, and they said, we ban you from direct TV. They will not allow me on there and say Kenneth Coburn is a lying, false teacher because they've got all those guys on there. They said, you're preaching against the guys that are on here. Well, I'm going to say that T.D. Jakes is a liar because he is. Uh, all the rest of those guys that are on there, Kenneth Copeland, uh, all the rest of them, uh, Fred Price, uh, Creflo Dollar, just name them. They lie as fast as they talk. Now, and he goes on all the way down here. He talks about the abomination of desolation. He says, if any says, lo, here, there is Christ, don't believe anybody that says he's here, there, because the next time the world sees me, he says, it'll be as the lightning shineth out of the east and cometh even unto the west, so shall also the coming, the parousia, the physical arrival of Christ be, P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. means physical arrival. When Christ comes back and arrives, all the world will see him. And then he gives us a time factor. In verse 29, here's a time element of when the end is going to come. Immediately after the seven years' tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light. I'm not going to go into all that. That's talking about what Micah said in the third chapter, that the sun will go down over the prophets and will no longer have a vision. That is idiomatic terminology. If the, sun do, if the moon doesn't give its light and the sun is turned to darkness, where does the moon get its light? It's a reflection from the sun, isn't it? The sun reflects on the moon. So if the moon, if the moon is turned to blood the way some of the writers put it, to turn to blood means to die. If the moon dies, that means the sun is not getting through to the moon. So it can reflect. If the sun, if the moon is, if the moon is turned to darkness, that means the moon is to turn to blood means to die. So if the moon dies on a night when we don't have any moon shining and it's pitch dark outside, it means there'll be no truth. It's figurative language. There'll be no truth. The sun will go down on the prophets and they'll not have a vision of Christ anymore. There'll be no truth. God, God, God uses the the seasons of the year are the moon being in the dark to determine, to show how that there won't be any truth. Now, so he says, after the tribulation of those days, there'll be no truth. At the end of time, there's not hardly any in the world today. Not hardly any truth. The preachers are lying. They don't know that, <laughs> they don't know there's no such thing as accept Christ and sinner's prayer for salvation. There is belief. There's faith. For salvation they don't know that Christmas is paganism most of them don't care if they know it they don't know that Easter is paganism that Jesus was God in the flesh he died to save sinners and he rose from the dead but this Easter is paganism so that's the darkness is talking about the moon turning to blood then he says this is what's going to be at the end of time then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. 
And this is the end of time. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. The last one hadn't sounded yet, has it? His angels are going to have seven trumpets. There's more than one angel. He shall send his angels, plural, with a great sound of a trumpet, each one of them. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven unto the other. Well, that's talking about the seven angels over in Revelation 8, 9, and 10. Look over there one more time. Revelation. Let me pinpoint this to show that there's no thousand-year reign. This will show you this. The last trump has to be sounding among a group of trumpets, doesn't there? Well, you got seven trumpets sounding in Revelation 8, 9, and 10. This has to do with what we just read in Matthew 24. He'll send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet at the end of time. But what are these angels? That's the point. Let's look over here in Revelation. In Revelation. One part of the Scripture is not separated from the other part of the Scripture. Now look here in Revelation 8. Revelation 8. Remember, trumpets are voices, right? They're there to tell you what's happening. Da, 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 da. Whatever it is, it's a call to something. And when the seventh one sounds, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel. Jesus, the word ark means beginning or head. Jesus is the head angel of God. Now, look in Revelation. The Lord is telling his apostles, He's going to send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. What are these angels? Remember the word angel. A-G-G-E-L-O-S. That's the word angel. It means a messenger. Well, a messenger is going to have to have a voice to tell people something, isn't he? He's not talking about literal heavenly angels with wings. That's not what he's talking about. He says here in Revelation 8, this is the opening of the seventh seal. There was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. I got some things to say on that, but I'm not going to say it now. And I saw the Tay. That's a definite article. It means one set. It's a particular set of seven angels. All through this book, he's talking about these seven messengers of God. Look back at Revelation, the first chapter. Revelation, the first chapter. What are these seven angels? Remember, seven in the Hebrew is the word Sheba. Seven is the word S-H-E-B-A. S-H-E-B-A. That's the word seven in the Hebrew. S-H-E-B-U-A-H is a form of Sheba. It means to take an oath to God or to seven one's self. Seven is the number of perfection. That's why he's got seven angels. He's got seven all through here. Seven angels, seven seals, seven vials, and the list, the list goes on and on. Now we see Jesus standing here in the midst of seven candlesticks. Remember, this is all figurative language. In fact, the first verse of this chapter says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto His servants, things which must shortly come to pass, and He sent and signified it by His angel, unto his servant John. He sent a special angel to John. Signify is the word semiao, S-E-M. comes from semion. That means a flag, a signal, a beacon. What these are, a flag or a signal is a 
pointer. Me and Mary were riding down the road, and we saw some lights flashing coming to church this morning. And what it meant was they had some problem down on the road in front of us. So I took immediately the next right, the next that was coming down New Shackle Island, coming to church. I took the next right, turned back left to the next street. I knew I would bypass this problem here, and there was a car wreck there. And these were pointers to me. Those lights flashing were pointers. They were a simeon telling me there was an accident down there and I needed to do something else before I got there. So I did. These, all these things in this book are pointers. They're saying, here's the problem, here's it. It's this word, Simeon, is the same word that the Pharisees used when they told Jesus. They said, give us a sign in Matthew 16. He said, the only sign to the unbeliever from now on will be the sign of the prophet Jonah. That was he was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, and then resurrection. The only sign you unbelievers are going to get, no more will you get a cloud by day and a fire by night. No more will you get manna out in the desert. No more will you get doves in the evening and manna in the morning. No more will you conquer your enemies. You get the resurrection, that's all. Well, these are pointers to us, to believers. And when you see Jesus standing in the midst of the seven candlesticks in verse 13, and then you go on down here to 16, he had in his right hand seven stars. You know what those seven stars and seven candlesticks are? In verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which he, thou sawest in his right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the seven angels. Since there are seven of them, there are seven angels. The seven stars are the seven messengers of the seven churches or the refined church and the seven candlesticks are the seven churches, are the refined church. And then he goes through these angels through, he goes through these seven churches in second, third chapter. We're not going to go into that. So the seven angels are the preachers of the seven churches, are the preachers of the refined church at the end of time. And each one of them has a trumpet. Now this is at the end of time. When the last one of these sounds... The mystery of God, according to Ephesians, the third, the third and the fifth chapter, the mystery of God is the church. Only the church knows the truth about who God is and about who Jesus is and knows the truth about predestination. And God opens our eyes when he takes the blinders off and we can see. Now, you see in the eighth chapter, you get seven angels with seven trumpets, and the first angel sounded in verse 7. We're not going to go into detail. I do this. I go into detail when I get in Revelation series. Then the second angel sounds in verse 8. The third angel sounds in verse 10. The fourth angel sounds in verse 12. We're getting to the seventh angel, which is the last angel, which is where we're going to be changed. Then in chapter 9, this fifth angel sound, that's where it goes into the locusts, like scorpions, the locusts. Locusts devour the literal crop, and scorpions are false teachers. The Lord told Ezekiel, you dwell among scorpions over there in Babylon. Be not afraid of their words. A scorpion was what they called a false teacher in the Middle East, and they still call them that. They live in a desert area over there. We would say snake in the grass, but we don't mean a snake crawling around the grass. We mean a con artist. That's what they called him. So, fifth angel sounds in, in 9 and 1. The sixth angel sounds in, in 9 and verse 13. The sixth angel sounded. And then the seventh or the last angel sounds and the last trump sounds in chapter 10. Let's read some of this. I want to show you that there is not a thousand year reign after this is over with. It's just not true. Look here in verse 1. I saw another mighty angel 
come down from heaven, clothed to the cloud, and Jesus is coming back in a great cloud, and every eye will see him in the first chapter. And a rainbow was upon his head. Gosh, I don't have time to go into rainbow. Rainbow is the word iris. And the iris of the eye is a wheel inside of a wheel. A wheel inside of a wheel. You see the wheel in the wheel over in Ezekiel, the first chapter. Ezekiel sees a wheel in a wheel. And I'm not going to go into great detail, but just to tell you the iris of the eye is also a wheel in the wheel. And the Assyrian war chariots and the Babylonian war chariots were wheels and wheels. I've got a picture of them. You look up chariot, you look up wheel in here, and the McLennan and Strong will show you the Assyrian war chariot. And they had, they were six spokes wheels. And when you have a six spoke wheel, you've got the shape of the Star of David. And this was the judgment that came upon Israel. Don't have time to go into all of it, but it has the same basic structure as the human eye. I've gone into that in detail. Now, so where was I? That's the rainbow. The rainbow, when God put a bow in the cloud after the flood, it wasn't, it was a, a rainbow when you look at it from a mountaintop or from an airplane. A rainbow is a circle. God used that. It's a wheel and a wheel. The human eye is a wheel and a wheel. And the chariots of the Babylonians that were coming in was a wheel and a wheel. I'm, I, I can't go into all that right now. I've got a picture. I got it over here. What did I do with it? Oh, here it is. I just happen to have it here. Can you see this? That's a rainbow I got off the internet. I'd seen them before. It's a wheel inside of a wheel. It's, that's what God put in the cloud. When they would go to peace, they would, that word bow, God put a bow in the cloud. It's the word sephath. It means a war bow. It means a war bow. And when they would hang their bows like this, they were at peace. When they would hang their bows up on the wall, when they were like this, they were at war. God hung his bow in the cloud and says, I won't war with you anymore. What's amazing, the... The human eye has got a, f a yellow spot here in the middle of the eye. I said I wouldn't say anything about it, but I have a hard time saying something about this and not getting further into it. And right in the center of the eye, back where the just a straight shot back in your eye, you have something called the yellow spot. It's called a fovea. It's called a yellow spot because that begins the refining of that begins the refining of colors. When you see something, you don't see shapes. You see a refinement of colors. It's what you see. And the color that's not there is what you see. <laughs> it's really funny. They call that refraction. I've I've got a book I've got a Gray's Anatomy is a book that you get when you're a first-year medical student, and you can get into Gray's Anatomy, and you find a lot of this. I found a lot of this in Gray's Anatomy. I'm not talking about the TV show. I'm talking about Gray's Anatomy, the medical book. That's where they got the name for the TV show. But uh, it's got a yellow spot there, and that yellow is the color of fire all through is the color of fire all through the Bible, yellow. Well, that is a refining color. Fire is considered yellow, refined. 
Well, you had these, on these chariots, you had these scythes, these little swords that stuck straight out. And they would cut people down, and that's what refined God's people when they were cut down by these chariots. God was refining Israel. You, you can actually match, actually match up the will of the... This was the same thing as the Star of David when those chariots would come into Israel and it was God's eye, right in the middle of the eye is the iris, not, not the iris, is the pupil. God says, when is, if you touch Israel, you've ch touched the apple of my eye. Apple means pupil. That's the word pupil in the Hebrew. You've punched me in the eye when you touch my people. And when you, when you touch God's eye, or when they attack us, the bow of the eye, right inside the, right inside the eye, is the lens back here, and you have the, you have the pupil. It's an opening where all the light goes in, and everything is refined. And there's seven colors that go in the eye. It when you it, you, you go through a prism. The lens, I know what a lens is about because I had both of mine replaced back in 87. I had cataracts on my eyes. And when the light goes through a prism, it breaks off into seven colors. That's amazing because you get that in Grey's Anatomy. It breaks off into seven colors. And that fovea, the center of the eye, is a yellow spot. And when these chariots come into Israel, they were flashing, Nahum says, Nahum 2 and 1, they were flashing and they looked like fire or lightning. The color of lightning is yellow. So those, those swords on the side of the chariots were matching up with the fovea of the eye. That's what refined the colors. When you're punched in the eye, the, these, the uh, lens bends back and you end up with a bow bending back and these, these, these uh, wheels, the inner part of the eye is a retractable wheel and the, and the iris begins to close up when you punch somebody in the eye and they begin to close up and you end up with it, when it wraps around the eye and it protects the eye and the eye starts swelling up and it begins, tears begin to run and God says, when I come back, you've punched me in the eye and I'm coming back with eyes as a flame of fire. And he's coming back in flaming and fire, taking vengeance on all those that have punched his people, hit his people and punched him in the eye. He said, I'm not going to put up with that. Now, that's the, but let's go back over here to Revelation 10. I believe this angel is Jesus. He's going to have a rainbow on his head, and he's at war with the world. This is, he's coming back with the last trumpet. And a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. This is Jesus. And he and he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. When the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not down. I don't know what they were. I've worked on this a long time. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. Now notice this. Here's what he says. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer end of time at the last trump because the next verse says the seventh trumpet sounds 
We're going to be changed at the seventh trump, right? The last trump. If we're changed at the last trump, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God, which is the church, is finished, is complete. That word finished, teleotes, <coughs> or teleos, T-E-L-E-I-O, I'll get it right in a minute, T-E-L-E-I-O-S, that means finished, it's complete, it's done. The end is here. There'll be no more time after the seventh trumpet. How could there be a thousand year reign when the seventh trumpet is sounded? You understand what I'm saying? When it sounds, time is over. So we're going to be changed at the very end of time when there's no thousand years. It'll be at the last trump when no more time is after that. Y'all understand what I just said? There'll be no more time after the seventh trump. How could there be a pre-trib rapture with seven years after the last trump? How could there be a thousand-year reign? There couldn't be, could there? How do these guys come up with this? It astounds me. It came from a man, a preacher. I can't even think of the guy's name. Can you think of it, Mike? That guy in England that was holding meetings. And this young girl stood up in a meeting. She's about 14 years old and said, I had a vision that Jesus was coming back before the tribulation. And, uh, Darby. huh? Darby. Darby. Jan Darby. Jan Darby is the guy that came up with this. And a girl said this in one of his meetings. She's about 14 years old. And she said, I had a vision that God's going to come back at the beginning of the tribulation. She's going to have to contradict all of this, isn't she? Huh? If the end comes at the seventh trump, and we're changed at the last trump, which is the seventh trump, and says time is no more at the seventh trump, how can there be a pre-trib rapture? How can there be a thousand years? There's not a thousand. It's not even the word thousand. It's the word kill. Do y'all see that from this right here? If the end of time is here at the last trump, it can't be a thousand years, can it? I don't know why nobody else has even seen this in the English. I got a lot to say about the thousand year reign. We're in the thousand right now. Now, thousand is plural. I got to go somewhere before this. We're in this reign for, with Christ right now. How much time do I have, Mike? Huh? I don't. I can't get all this in here. It is so much to this. Let's go over to the twentieth chapter. There's a reason for that thousand years. A reason for it, but it's not a thousand, it's two thousand. Thousand. You can get this off the internet if you want to. Thousand is not a number. Thousand is a noun, just like dozen, just like deer. Just like fish. He caught fish. How many did he catch? One or twenty? A deer, so deer ran across the road. How many? One or twenty or thirty? How many deer? Just like he wants a dozen eggs. How many do you want? Just twelve? A dozen is twelve. Uh... How much does your car weigh? A ton, two tons, three tons? A ton is 2,000. 1,000 is a noun. There was a purpose for the 1,000 years, but it wasn't 1,000, it was 2,000. There's a purpose for it. You can find it in the 20th chapter of Revelation. The purpose for the 1,000 not thousand, two thousand. There's a purpose for it. Look here in Revelation 20. Before I ever... 
this thing of a thousand year reign bothered me when I was a little boy. Man, I was listening to my father preach at 11 and 12 years old. I'd hear one of his friends. Daddy didn't know anything about Revelation. He wouldn't preach on it. But he believed in a preacher of rapture and all this silly stuff. I wish he was here and I could tell him that was wrong, Daddy. Let me tell you. I wasn't taught any of these things that I teach here at home in my family. I wasn't taught any of it. I had a guy writing to me, a guy or a woman. I want to know your qualifications. Well, how about studying for 62 years, sometimes 30, 35, 40 hours a week researching in my library that I've built over, over 50 years? I've got thousands of books in my library. I have studied my brains out. That's all you have to do to learn. Just study, 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 study. Don't quit studying. If you do that, read, 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 read. I've read everything I get a hold of in my life. I want to learn. I want to know what. I have an inquiring mind. <laughs> I buy the inquirer. I want to know what do they have to say. Who's divorcing who? Who's lying? Who's not? It has a little bit of truth in all of it. And then I like I want to know about what they got to say about Kennedy. I want to know what they say about who killed him. I've got my own beliefs about who killed Kennedy. I believe it had to do with the mob. And the CIA was uh, working with them. It's, stuff's crazy. I want to know about the Old West, how what, how what these guys were really like. Most of them were killers. Billy the Kid was a murderer. Jesse James was a murderer. They didn't care who they killed. Jesse would kill his own man if they got in his way. These We've made heroes out of people that don't need to be heroes, haven't we? Make movies about them. Now look here in Revelation 20. I'll show you the... There can't be a preacher of rapture. At the seventh trump or the last trump... Do I have any time, Mike? They had seven trumpets that sounded in the in the days God's covenant with was Israel, and He says, "I'll give you plenty of food if you're obedient to Me." The food months was from May was I'll get right in a minute was from March April. That's when the first crops come in, up until the end of the harvest. End of harvest. And they had seven trumpets sounded in that time period. This is where all the crops come in and Israel could keep their promises to God, all of the things that he said they had to do. So in March, April, that was the first month of their year, Nisan. They would, some will call it a beeb. That's what they called it in Israel. But Nisan, when they were carried into captivity, was what was called in Babylon. Nisan, on Nisan 14, they had Passover. And then 50 days later, they had Pentecost. And these were all festivals that all the males had to come back to Pentecost. And then at the end of the harvest, they had all the rest of their holidays... Feast of Ingathering, which is the same thing as the Feast of Huts or the Feast of Tabernacles. They celebrated their 40 years in the wilderness in this Ingathering, a Feast of Huts, the Feast of Tabernacles. And coupled with, that, coupled with that was the Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement where they sprinkled the, the high priest would sprinkle the Ark of the Covenant with the blood of a goat. That's what Jesus was in our place. So, at the first month of their festivals, they sounded a trumpet. At the second month, they sounded a trumpet. At the third month, they sounded a trumpet. These were called the Feasts of Trumpets. And at the fourth, they would sound a trumpet. Fifth would sound a trumpet. And at the sixth, they would sound a trumpet. And at the seventh would enter in the very end. This was the end of the harvest where they separated the sheep from the goats and harvested all the crop and separated the wheat from the tares. This was the end of their 
their harvest year and the sheep from the goats were separated and at the last trump the sheep will be separated from the goats the wheat from the tares and we're the wheat and the tares are the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction and they had seven trumpets and the end came at the end of their harvest seven trumps Joshua marched around Jericho with seven priests had seven trumpets they marched around it seven days and they blew the trumpets on the seventh time around and the walls fell and judgment was immediate I don't know how how does how can I see this and all these guys miss all these things now let's look here in Revelation 20 Revelation 20 and I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit I ate that translation Abu sauce is the word bottomless pit What gets me is that <coughs> the locusts come out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 9 and the beast world system comes out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 11. Well, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, did they come out of a hole in the ground? No. They came out of Abusos. Abusos comes from Bathos. Bathos means a place of great knowledge. And placing the alpha in front of a word as a negative particle, placing the alpha in front of bathos, it negates bathos. It means a place of no knowledge. It translates abusos. So all those things that come out of the bottom of the skip, they come out of a place of no knowledge. And in the beast system ruled on the Mediterranean Sea. And only one place in there had the knowledge of God, and that was Israel. Nobody else had the knowledge of God. That was the beast. Then, in a great chain in his hand, he laid hold on the dragon, Dracon, the smooth talker, that old serpent which is the devil, and Satan, Satanos, the adversary of God, and bound him, not a thousand years, but two thousand years. The word is kilia, not thousand. To show you what has to be now, I discovered this before I read anybody else. I've studied numbers. You, you study numbers uh, like E.W. Bullinger. They'll tell you some really peculiar things. I've got books on numbers. I had one book. Somebody picked it up and went away with it. I had one book called The History of Zero. <coughs> and all these numbers people, I do not believe the translators knew anything about numbers because I've done a lot of study on numbers. Any multiple of 10, 100, or 1,000, all these numbers experts, 10, 100, 1,000, is a form of the original number. These are forms of one. 1,000 is actually singular. Kilia is plural. And that's the word here, thousand. It has to be two thousand or more. It's feminine gender, and when Kili is used, it's always in the singular there. This is plural, Kili. So bound is the word Dio. He's only bound for a purpose for the two thousand year period. Now watch what it says. And cast that old dragon into the place of no knowledge, bound him away from the church, forbid him. That word deal means to forbid. It's the same word as bind and loose. Forbid. Bind means to forbid. Loose means to permit. Bind means unlawful. Loose means lawful. And shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till this 2,000 years is finished. The reason has to be 2,000 is Satan is going, not going to be allowed to deceive, deceive the nations. That word nation is everything in this verse. Everything. It's the word ethnos. 
Ethmos means non-Jews or Gentiles. There's only one place in history, since there's not going to be a thousand years, it's going to be impossible for that to be a time period where the Jews can't be, where the Gentiles can't be deceived because there's not going to be a thousand years. Everything's going to end at the end of time, isn't it? Where can this apply? It can only apply, it can only apply from Acts 2 to the end of time which will be at the last trump, and there'll be no thousand years, and there'll be no preacher of rapture. It can only apply in Acts 2 with the birth of the New Testament, Gentile, spiritual Israel church. That's the only place in history, because before that, the Jews were, they're the ones that, had the, that were commanded by God to come to Him, and only starting in Acts 2, where God pours out of His Spirit on all flesh, red, yellow, white, black, and brown flesh, which they didn't have any opportunity for truth from Adam up until Jesus. And now the Gentile church for 2,000 years, Satan cannot deceive the Gentile church. Can you see that? The 2,000... It's 2,000 years, and we're living in the millennium right now. It's not millennium. Forget that. Millennium comes from mill and anim. That's how bad the translators were. They didn't know anything about numbers. When you find kilia, you have kilia, kilios, kilioi. You got plural through there. And it can only be 1,000 if it has a determiner. When it says he was, let me straighten something out here about when it says he was bound to 8,000 years. See, A, did you see that in verse 2? He was bound to 8,000 years. A is a definite article. You have three articles in English, the, a, and an. In the Greek, you have no indefinite articles. A was put there by the translators. It doesn't have A in the original text. You understand what I'm saying? There were no indefinite articles in the Greek. If it was indefinite, you had to go by the context. What was it talking about? You do have some words. Thousand would be only a thousand years. When you see thousand, it is a noun, not a if you have, if you have, he had five sheep, that's a numeral, that's an adjective. If he had 25 camels, that's an adjective, it's how many, which, what kind of, or how many is an adjective, and that's what it'll tell, 25 camels. But if you get up to a thousand, you have to look at the context of Scripture to see what it is. Do we have to learn all about numbers? would be good if we could. I don't believe... It. When you get into... into uh, the entomology of mathematics, I've got a book just on numbers. It's about that thick. and it just I've got all kinds of books on numbers. I buy every kind of book I can get on numbers. I don't believe those translators knew anything about numbers. They didn't know a lot about other things. Why would they know about numbers? I've got an article from the Internet, and it will tell you there's many words for thousand. There's the English word thousand, thousand, the old English pusend, and the Germanic pusandi, and then you've got well, all these other words, I'm not going to take time to read them. And the, and the, from the internet, before I studied this, I studied numbers, I studied zeros, 
you got to, these guys didn't know anything about a lot of things that translated. They just knew the Greek, and they, the things that they ran into they didn't understand, they would make it say something it doesn't say. It doesn't say a thousand. A is not in the Greek. You got to go with, unlike cardinal numbers, which would be one, two, three, four, five, and so forth, the word thousand is a noun like dozen and needs a determiner to function as a numeral, numeral or an adjective. It has to say a thousand years, but you can't do that, so you've got to have something to point to it to show whether it's a thousand or it's two thousand. He says thousand has to have a determiner to whether it is one or two or three thousand. It has to have something to determine it. Thousand can be used also in plurals. It doesn't take an S when preceded by a determiner. Most English words before 1923, uh, thousand was looking, I don't know what he's talking about there. Categories, English terms derived from Middle English. He goes into that concerning this. Then he says you've got kilioi, kilios, feminine, noun, plural, meaning thousands. It doesn't mean 1,000 just because it says it in the King James Bible. I found out the translators, there's a lot of things they didn't know. And he goes on in this. Let me see if I can give you something else that's really interesting. But I, I came to the conclusion that 1,000 wasn't in the text. I'll tell you what really bothered me. When I was a boy and I'd hear one of those independent Baptist preachers read this in Revelation, what really bothered me, my father would go along with them and he didn't know much about the Bible. I don't mean that as an insult. He just didn't. Never studied. Was well, when you get down to this verse, look here in verse 4. You've got to pay real close attention to the words. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Now remember... When this was written, the way they destroyed their enemies was by cutting their heads off. It doesn't mean that everybody through the ages will have lose their heads, but that's why those Arabs still over there, they still cut people's heads off. For the witness of Christ, or you could fall by a machine gun fire for the witness of Christ, that would be the beheaded or the sword. For the word of God in which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark on their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ. That's Arist active, or excuse me, Arist indicative. That's Arist indicative means they've already reigned with him. Where and what kingdom? In the kingdom of God which is in you. And God is the king, Christ is the king that's in you. When you start defining these words and get tenses on the words, this preacher of rapture and, and millennium makes no sense whatsoever. When the last trumpet sounds, time is over. Well, if a thousand-year rain happens, wouldn't that be time? Huh? It's done. When he comes back for us, it's over. And what always got me, I, got, I, under, I thought of this when I was very young. Well, if we're in a thousand-year rain... We're going along at the end of that thousand years. What happens then? Okay, everybody shift gears. We're going into heaven now. <laughs> I never understood that. If the thousand years is so great, why don't we just stay on the earth? There's a lot of things I couldn't figure out. It didn't make any sense to me. As Even when I was young, I'd say, where do they get this? I couldn't, nothing added up and those this, has anybody seen a dispensational church strung around a church? You've seen that? It's ridiculous. It's not what's happening at all. I had, I was going to tell you about something else that used to puzzle me. I couldn't figure out why he would say here, for the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Till the thousand years was finished, that would be at the last trump. <laughs> I'd look at that. You mean there's going to be a thousand years and at the end of the thousand years that'll be the first resurrection? The first resurrection is the church. So you mean we have to live through a thousand years and then we, our bodies are changed? 
No, we're living in the 2,000 years right now during the life of the Gentile church. That's the 2,000. Nothing else makes sense, does it? Y'all, can y'all see that? Can anybody say yes or no? I want you to see this. It's one of those errors that's been taught in the church. It's two of the errors, preacher of rapture and thousand-year reign. One other thing. When the seventh trumpet sound, the kingdoms, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. That's Revelation 10 and 15. He conquers all of His enemies. And the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians says, At His coming... He'll conquer all of his enemies, and the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. How can you live in a millennium in a thousand years and people dying all through it, which is what they teach? And how could you be in a... If he comes at the beginning of a tribulation, people are dying all through the tribulation, how can his coming destroy all of his enemies? People are going to be dying all through that. And how could say, Satan rise up at the end of a thousand years when he, at his coming, he destroys all of his enemies? I'll go through that another time. I don't like what preachers preach on hardly anything. Not on salvation. It's faith that saves, not a sinner's prayer. It is faith that saves, not accepting Christ. I don't like what's going on and people don't like me for not liking it. I don't like what's happening in the churches. The churches are a mess. Preachers are just, they're messed up, all of them. I don't like listening to Billy Graham or Charles Stanley. They conclude nothing. I'm out of time, ain't I, Mike? One minute. Well, I got a dozens of places to go in this i just can't well i'll just i'll just read that in first corinthians 15 if i got a minute first corinthians 15 and i may run out of time before i get it out but christ is going to come in verse 25 christ is coming and he must reign he's reigning in the kingdom right now which is in us if the kingdom is in us, isn't that the 2,000 years? Till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. How can you have people dying through a millennium if when he comes, he destroys his enemies? The last one is death. How could people be dying through a, tribula a seven-year tribulation? And he's still got enemies out there because he's got death out there. Death is going to go when the seventh trumpet sounds. No millennium, no seven years. There'll be seven years of tribulation, but we'll be here facing it. Well, let's pray. Lord, thank you for truth. God, I sometimes I get real frustrated at the world, at the preachers, not telling your truth. Thank you for all that you do, and you're doing everything. Fight our battles. Lord, I pray that you'll guide us in everything, strengthen the flock, and we'll praise you for it all in Christ's name. Amen. I hope that I have gotten that over to you. I, that's something that's bothered me all my life since I was a young preacher, that people couldn't see it. Too many people think their pastor's got some secret chamber in the back of their head. My pastor knows things. If he was here, he could straighten you out. No, he couldn't. They don't know nothing. If it's in their heart, it's going to come out their mouth, isn't it? Of the abundance of heart, the mouth speaks. Your pastors don't have secret chamber in their mind where they got some truth. And they just don't want to deal with it. Huh? 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 He said about the seven years. 
tribulation. We'll suffer up to the end of time. Right. We'll suffer through that 70th week of Daniel, 70 weeks. Okay. We'll suffer all the way through it. And at the end is the little season where Satan will be loose. Well, the little season is here now. The little season is going to be the apostasy. It's here. Yeah, the little season is at the end of time. I've never seen the world as apostate as it is. I've never seen, I've never seen preachers being so stupid.